Oh, Great. Oh. Now we've got to edit that out, Joe. Uh-oh. Oh. And you held it up to the you camera. Know. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Linux Weekly. Daily Wednesdays, where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vince Stone, joined every week by Joe Bryant and everybody watching us live. Know. Just doing a little pre-show, talking about the weather, talking about... Yes. Walking three miles in the snow, talking about coasting <laughs> over bridges into petrol stations. That's what you're missing out on. Yes. That's what you're missing. <laughs> Go back and check out the Live and Uncut series if you're a patron. We got that in podcast format. Also, we got a YouTube channel with all of our uncut stuff on. It comes out a week later. Doesn't cost anything. Put up some ads. Go put it in your ears or in your eyes, mm -hmm. however you want <laughs> to do it. I realized something earlier this week. What then? It was kind of a dark time, Joe Bryant. <laughs> I read a thing on Reddit where like, there was a teacher. He's like, man, these kids do not know how to use computers. We're, it's rough. We're not getting the funding to have like real computer classes anymore. And I'm like, it can't be that bad. I text a couple of friends. I got a couple of friends in education. I'm like, how bad is it? And I was like, oh, they dumb. <laughs> what a verbatim what you're, oh, they dumb. Oh, boy. <laughs> Like, we're just skipping out on this basic education of like, oh, well, they know how to use an iPad. Clearly, they know how to use a computer. No, they don't. Yeah, I nah, know. Yeah. They don't. Uh, <laughs> the, and, you know, I've run into that with the, you know, upcoming generation of like when I say, you know, even like with Linux, even if you got the uh, fortitude to sit down, I'm putting my own, you're doing better than a lot of people if you're sitting there. I don't care what operating system you're installing. If you're like, I'm going to install my own operating system. Even if yeah. you're reinstalling Windows, we can still hang out because that takes yes. more than. And, uh, but I run into this on Linux when I say, and I brought it up on the show. I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but it's a real thing. You're going to need to compile this. And they go, whoa, wait, 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 hey, 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 hey. no, no, no. Uh, you, you mean click on a button, right? And I'm like, no, 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 we're going to set up a build environment. Like, nah, -uh, not happened on my watch. <laughs> no, sir. Maybe a flat pack. I'm like, can't do a flat pack. I have to build something like, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to do that. That's uh, no, mm -mm. which you rewind just a decade ago. I'm like, well, you just did that. You just did that if you ran Linux, you didn't think twice. Like, why do we say all the time, which might be to confu really confuse some people when I say, yeah, just pull the get, you know, clone the get and build it. I'm like, wait, what? Moon speak? Yeah. I don't understand that. <laughs> Had somebody ask that this week. This week, we're on Wednesday. So it might have been Monday or Tuesday, unless I've invented some extra days in there. Because uh, I did the thing on, um, what do we play, Lethal Company, and I made a video about how to get the mods installed. Somebody yeah. can find the download link on the GitHub page. No idea. Yeah. So I, <laughs> where, I, I, nobody tells me where to download this mod at. Where's this app image? And I'm like, it's right there under releases. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but Usually on the right-hand panel. <laughs> we got like this weird skill issue problem, and it's real. I've had it confirmed for me by educated people who deal with the kids coming in. They're doing the, they're doing the best they can, man. And I was thinking about my generation, us, uh, us millennials, which is kind of a broad, you know, there, there's so much wiggle room in the millennial. <laughs> yeah, there, there is. I'm not a millennial, but... <laughs> I'm technically a millennial, like depending yeah. on what Google or whatever you search and like, I'm like skirting it. Like if you squint, yeah, you're but just on the edge. our generation, your generation. Yeah. Gen X. Is, you know, like, <laughs> me and Jilla, like, we're, we're in that part where we have to, or like really early Gen X and, uh, or like really like late boomer that area where a lot of us fall into, you know, we need like mm -hmm. our own special category when it comes to computer knowledge because we were there in the late 90s 2000s and we got all that or you know in maybe the early 80s all the way up we have that knowledge base and i found myself it's something i you know i i wrote one evening later this uh week where i was like we're the generation that has to do tech support for the zoomers and the boomers oh yeah yeah <laughs> we catch it on both ends we, we got to take care of the because there is a <laughs> <Yes>. deficient <laughs> Efficiency and technical literacy for the young kids coming up and for the seniors mm -hmm. in society. I'm like, why well, can't catch, catch it on both ends, man? Oh, yeah. And uh, Jordan's even talked about this uh, with the kid. And he's like, yeah, it's like he, he has a bet. He's like, I'll quit monitoring your computer and stuff when you want to set it up yourself, mm -hmm. reinstall <laughs> everything. It's like, nope. That's fine. I'll just live with the monitoring and you managing it. And like, 
It's going to be interesting times. Yes. Interesting <laughs> times indeed. How about you, Joe Bryant? You, oh, boy. Uh, speaking of weather, right? Yeah. Speaking of weather, uh, we are having the Pineapple Express atmospheric river ap- apocalypse here in Southern California and all the state of California. It keeps raining and raining and raining, but we actually really need it. And what was really cool then this morning, I woke up and there was sun. <laughs> so I was happy to see the sun today. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so pretty. <laughs> so that was really nice. And uh, during this atmospheric river, I've been having fun playing demos for the Steam Next Fest and adding kind of my favorite, when I play through my favorite de- demos, you've got to make sure to hit your, your uh, wish list. So that you'll notified when the full game becomes available. <laughs> and uh, uh, some of the games I've been playing, uh, one is Eric and the Ruined Kingdom. It's really cool. It's, it's kind of uh, like a, a Monument Valley, Valley kind of game, a 3D platformer where depending on what angle you, you move the mouse, uh, the structure lines up and your character goes around it. So that's been a lot of fun. And then, did you know... There's a Lost in Space game coming, <laughs> and it's really, really quite Is it fun. VR so I can play as the robot and I pretend I snap and just go around color uh, I don't, you know what? I didn't check if it had VR Dude, support, I really but... like the one thing about the movie. Who yeah. remembers the early 2000s uh, Lost in Space movie? Yes. <laughs> that happened. Uh, that I, happened. I, I really enjoyed the robot in that movie. I'm like, all right, I like that Robbie the Robot, right? Yeah. Well, this is actually Danger, Will Robinson. This is the... Uh, take off of the original series of Lost in Space done in the 60s. And it's very well done, very tongue in cheek. And it's a click in point adventure um, uh, done in 3D, which is nice. It's not 2D, it's 3D. So it's, it's really been a lot of fun. And then the characters are on point. You got the, the sniffling uh, doctor, you know. <laughs> And the robot, you know, shakes his arms. <laughs> I always felt bad for the doctor. The, bo- the doctor's stuck on a foreign planet surrounded by a bunch of dum-dums. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I got to put up with these people. All right. Yeah, and he goes and sits in his lounge chairs and let everyone else do all the work. He's yeah. like just trying to get away from the idiots. And he's like, all right, I don't want to be around you people. I understand the pain, that. The pain. It is. It's suffering. <laughs> yes. You build up tolerance over time. That's cool. Yeah. I got a couple that I found um past couple of days. I've been going through them. Uh, we're going to be talking about more on Saturday, Linux Gamecast Weekly. Come check that out. We're going to have some picks yeah. for the demos. Uh, Linux native demos, too. That is that is like the difficulty multiplayer, uh, multiplier, <laughs> I should say. I think there's 186 native Linux games on Steam Next Fest right now. Yeah, there are. No yeah. excuse. Except for that one guy I saw on Linux underscore gaming. There was a guy trying to promote his game, right? Trying to promote his game. And... Uh, this is on Reddit, and people are like, man, this thing, uh, we downloaded it. It doesn't run very well. So he kept on saying, he was like, oh, no, no, no don't use that. Use Proton instead. It, yeah. was mar- it was marketing. This guy just re- exported a busted Linux build. So he was like, I got Linux, guys. Hey, come check out my game. I'm like, dude, don't do that. If you're that person, uh, stop. Not good. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> not a good look. Not a good look. However, what is a good look? It's a blast from the past. Something. We probably all used at one point, or at least you've installed it due to, there's no way you <laughs> yeah. can put Linux on a disk. Yeah. So this definitely isn't Danger Real, Real Robinson, <laughs> which is awesome. This is awesome sauce, actually. <laughs> and thank you to our Theron, our advisor on Patreon, on our friend in chat for putting a story in our show suggestions on our Discord. You can do that if you become a patron. So. One of my favorite mini Linux distros of all time is back. DSL or dang small Linux. I'm not going to say what the D <laughs> actually says at the beginning because I can't say that live on air. <laughs> so it's let's just say dang small Linux. And uh, that small Linux distro that came out in 2002 that just pulled my heartstrings and let me discover the beauty of the Flexbox X window manager. Yeah, that is the distro where I fell in love with Flexbox. <laughs> but D 
DSL Linux is no longer 50 megabytes and tailored to 486 computers that I used to run it on and the like. And I installed it on lots of my uh, vintage computers here in my collection. The creator, John Andrews, states the new goal of DSL is to put as much usable desktop distribution into an image small enough to fit on a single CD or a hard limit of 700 megabytes. This project is meant to service older computers and have them continue to be useful far into the future. So they, they've upped their storage game, Vin, <laughs> for sure. DSL yeah, is we now- We kind of brought that up just a little <laughs> bit in the um, pre-pre-show before we even went yeah. live, man. Isn't it kind of strange? Like We're looking at like that 700 megs and that used to be the full Linux distro. Yeah. It was yeah. not that long ago, you know, we're probably not talking like 12, ago. 13 years ago. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're like, oh, that's a small version now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so true. So DSL is now based on the small and robust Debian based distribution Antics Linux, which I really love. And Debian's app is now actually fully enabled, unlike the original. And it has two window managers, just like the original Flexbox and JWM. And it still has some of my favorite apps and web browsers from the original release of DSL Linux, including Dillo, XMMS, Classic Music Player, <laughs> Silfeed, Vim, and Nano. And it's got lots of shiny new classic apps as well, like Bad, the Bad Wolf web browser, which I really like, Ranger, MT Paint, MPV, Tmux, Abbey Word. ZZZFM file manager and LeafPad. And what's really cool, I just, I, I have this long history with DSL Linux. I got to meet the creator of DSL, John Andrews, and his team back at the Southern California Linux Expo way back in 2007. And he had become a regular at um, that scale and the following skills. And I donated money to the DSL project, and John. Gave me this he rare. Sold you some merch. Yes, he. Sh <laughs> no, he actually gave me this rare DSL hat, which I forever cherish. They were not giving these out at the booths. No, he actually went home and and gave me one of his own personal <laughs> damn small Linux hats. <laughs> well, great. Oh, oh. Now we've got to edit that out, Joe. Uh oh, oh. And you held it up to the you camera. Knew, you knew that was going to happen. <laughs> I meant dings small. Linux. Don't oh, worry, Joe. Boy. We're going to turn you into a broadcasting professional. <laughs> yes. Ladies so. and gentlemen. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. Um, yeah. You can go ahead and like download that, though, right? Just right now, put it on yeah. an ISO. Can you put it on a thumb yeah. drive? Yes, you can. It's, uh, um, it's still in alpha release, mm. but uh, you know, keep checking back, and a stable one, I'm sure, will be showing up soon. <laughs> now, you do have a screenshot of it, though, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. So there's uh, the screenshot with the Flexbox. It's kind of a neat kind of uh, steampunk kind of theme, which is really cool. And the web browser, uh, Bad Wolf, is, is showing the LWW uh, site, uh, our, our page for LWW on linuxgamecast.com. And there's Conky running with all the stats. <laughs> It's, gotta, it's really cool. It's a nice, really nice theme. I yeah. like this theme. And I like how the, the it used the orange theme from Flexbox to match the background. Pretty cool. That's a weird blast from the past. Uh, having a small Linux utility is important, you know, something that you can still, but storage mm -hmm. has changed and it's kind of changed like the focus of just how necessary it was because it's yeah. weird to explain to somebody. How cool it was to be able to boot a Linux distro and be able to get up to a busy box or something of the like. It's mm -hmm. just a floppy disk, like the utility yeah. of that. Like that was very handy. It's yes. weird to think about when like the smallest thumb drive that you can find right now is like 32 gigs, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like, of course, I'll just put, I'll put 19 distributions on this thing. Uh, getting yeah. it down to 700 megs is no small task. You are making some sacrifices. So let's, let's not, I don't want anybody to download this and install it. Think they're going to get classic old school not even i don't want to say old school like this is not really meant as a desktop replacement 
I want you to keep that in mind. This is still like a small, low power PC because you're not going to get Chrome. You're not going to get Firefox. <laughs> They're not there now. Yeah. You can always go back and install them. You're not going to get LibreOffice. Yeah. You're going to get Abbey Word. And uh, yeah, MPV makes perfect sense. I use MPV on all my boxes. Yes. That's just what I use. Great um, media player. And you too can squint at XMMS like we all uh-huh, do now yes. when it opens up <laughs> and it's postage stamp because that <laughs> UI doesn't scale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That Trust us. Trust us. That used to look dope at 800 by 600 to 1024 by 768. You're like, yeah, that's awesome, man. That's slick. <laughs> look at it. Audacious actually had a had a command to enlarge the interface that I used to use all the time. <laughs> oh man. Uh, good times. Good times. Up next, shoving code in a vault. Yeah. So uh this is actually something completely awesome. And boy, uh it's probably the the coldest open source has ever gotten. <laughs> so on February 2nd, 2020, the Arctic World Archive contained a snapshot of all the active public repositories from GitHub and preserved that data for generations to come in the Arctic Code Vault. What's awesome is that AWA is a joint initiative between, and excuse my pronunciation, Store, is in Norsk, <laughs> Spitsbergen, <laughs> Colt Company, and a long-term digital preservation provider named PIQLAS. <laughs> I'll just uh, spell that one. So the Arctic World Archive put the GitHub data inside a sealed chamber in a decommissioned coal mine deep underground, about 250 to 300 meters. It's pretty wild, man. I mean, it yeah. really is. I mean, taking that snapshot in 2020 just behind the scenes, doing the thing, and mm-hmm. they put it on film. They put it on yeah. film and just not your regular ordinary cellulite. No, 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 no. This is 1,000 year hardened film mm-hmm. that probably might last that long. We don't know because it hasn't been around for a thousand. I love it when something says, This is going to last this long. I'm like, So you've made one a thousand years ago? No, no, but hey, that's beside the point. Now, yeah. instead of pictures, they decided to go with QR codes as they were showing in the video for our audio listeners. Mm-hmm. 186 reels is what it took put this archive together so you get 21 terabytes of storage out of 26 reels of film with qr codes on it so the data density is not that high but it should stick around for a while and of course with each reel there's an index guide showing basically how to you know the future humanity how you can recover the data bits that are on the reels of film the only thing i would take exception to Maybe the film's going to stick around for a thousand years. The instructions to extract the data should be carved in stone. Yeah. Why? Let me tell yeah. you why. We know <laughs> stone sticks around for a thousand years because it's all over the place with writing on it. <laughs> or they could make stones with QR codes on them. <laughs> uh, no. I mean, it would be, you know, cost prohibitive, but. Yes. I, I, that, that's my compromise. Like the instructions yeah. to get the data off, like. Put some tablets in there. So you, yeah. could, you don't have to. You can use clay. You know, don't write it in <laughs> cuneiform. But it, we we know the uh, longevity of that medium for storing data is top notch, even when it's just out in the open. So hmm, it's still a really cool project. That would bring it up. It's fun. Yeah. Glad Jill put it in the notes. Now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you might know me from is I do a bunch of audio stuff. Uh, now, I don't do, hey, I want to play around with audio. There's plenty of people that do that. I do the, like, hey, I want to set up a recording studio and I want to get like to business. Like, like I want something that works and works good. Pro-level stuff, real pro-level stuff. Can you do it on Linux? Yes, you can. I always try to help with that. And we all know about Pipewire. Pipewire's the future. Pipewire's great. It's, it's going to be the one sound system to rule them all. And somebody, uh, a user in the interfacing Linux forums, we have forums over there where if you ask me a question, I will answer your question personally. Mm-hmm. The, I was like, hey man, I got a Firewire interface. I'm using Pipewire. Well, we found out after a couple of back and forths, you can, cool thing about forums, kids, you can go back and read the conversation as it's happening. Mm-hmm. And uh, like, well, Pipewire, huh? Hmm. Well, you should be able to use the FATO drivers. If you get a Firewire audio interface, why would you want one? Guess what? I did a video very recently for interfacing Linux, comparing a audio interface, you know, a brand new, newish, you know, 2019 Scarlet 
uh, Gen 3 versus uh, one from 2010 and from pre-Sonos. Guess what? Spec-wise, same thing. Neil hasn't moved, kids, despite what marketing and the uh, advertisers want you to believe. Like, we figured this analog digital conversion stuff out, like, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, and I'll say that until I'm blue in the face. So that's why I'm so gung-ho for Firewire Audio, being, being able to keep that equipment around out of landfills, and it's still usable. It's not like you're taking a quality hit by using it. It's the same stuff. But person wanted to use with Firewire audio interfaces, there's two sets of drivers. There's the Alsa stack, which is the great one. My buddy Tack created that. He's a madman. But what it lets you do is use your audio interface as a sound card. You plug it in and it just shows up like the focus right does. You know, you get one of the little Scarlets or you get a Motu or whatever you got. You got to go Alex. So you plug it in, it shows up. Linux is good like that. Good to go. Nice. Those aren't the drivers you want for your pro audio though. Firewire audio interfaces are not sound cards. They were designed as professional audio recording interfaces. They were designed to be cut in, cut on, cut in. I don't know how you do that, but if you find a way, send me a note. You cut them on and you connect them to your PC and you use your digital audio workstation. You use your DAW, you use Reaper, you use Bitvig, you use whatever, Pro Tools, Adore. That's what they're made for. That's what they were designed for. They're professional recording interfaces. They were not designed. Also sound cards watching you. No, no, no. That was never in the design spec. So when you try to make them multitask and do stuff that you get weird effects with the ULSA stuff, they don't make very good sound cards. You can usually kind of get them to work. That was the example I did in my most recent video of holding up and like these two look an awful lot alike, but they're completely different beasts. Like one thing that Firewire interface has a full on DSP in it with a built in mixer and a bunch of other nice. advanced psychotic stuff. Focus writes just a USB external sound card. Okay, it just happens to have a microphone input in the front of it. Different devices. Now, this person's like, but you want to use those FATO drivers to do pro recording. What the FATO drivers do is put a FireWire interface into its original mode. And it's like, all I do is I process, I'm capable of like starting up, I can run my mixer, and I can connect to a digital audio workstation. It, when, when you're running the FATO drivers, you're not listening to YouTube videos or Spotify, you're not playing games, it doesn't even show up on the system as a sound card. And that's what this person wanted. I said, well, Pipewire's not too bad. I, I think um, Wim even posted a thing about uh, FATO drivers on the Pipewire page. Here, try this, try this. They tried it. I said, I can't get anything working. And of course, I got to show up I'm like, well, let me handle it. I'll show you how to do it. It won't be a problem. It was a problem. Cool. <laughs> it was a problem. So I played around with it for a little bit. This is a post I made on Twitter. I'm like, Fado loads, then crashes after a few minutes. No audio. I'll play around with it. Maybe I'll get to it. And uh, Wim writes back. He's a creator of pipe wires. Like, I still don't have a firewire device to test. I'm like, oh, geez. Okay. Well, I guess I need to do some testing. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Interfacing Linux, kids. This is a website I've been working on, but. That's exactly what I did. I did some testing, Finstone testing. So I ran it through everything you'd need to know about Pavu Control, QP Graph, how it works in the different modes. You know, I just grabbed a Firewire interface from the stack and how you can set your sample rate and buffer size. This is something you need where you wouldn't typically ever even think about this with desktop audio, but if you're switching between sample rates and buffer sizes between uh, sessions in your digital audio workstation, found a good script to do that from the command line so you can automate it what type of round trip latency differences you're going to be dealing with. With the ALSA drivers, uh, they're pretty bad. Um, but the ultimate conclusion is, you know, how it runs with Reaper performance as well. All the digital audio workstations expect to work with ALSA or Jack. So Pipewire's got a couple of modes. Pipewire's got a mode where it can work with Jack and work with ALSA, but Pipewire's also got a thing where it can be Jack. It has its own Jackness to it. And it's pretty bad. Um, I mean, it does function, but it's much higher latency, much higher CPU usage. So you're better using Pipewire with the Jack compatibility where it's still, you know, just kind of hooking up with Jack. That's good. Unfortunately, after an entire day of throwing everything I knew to throw at it, I couldn't get the FATO drivers to work. And that seems to be, that's where we ended up in that forum post. All this will be linked in the show notes. You can kind of see us going back and forth. We came to the same conclusion of like, 
the scaffolding's there, but it just doesn't function yet. So my recommendation, as I said in the video and in the post, is if you are the person who is fully aware, because what I don't want people to do is, you know, you see something like that presonus I used in the video, it stomps a little scarlet solo. Those are like 99 bucks. You know, they got one input, one output, you know, in stereo. Like that presonus again, it's got the mixer in the game. Audio quality, DSPs, way better. Well, uh, let's just say equal. Let's just be fair. Let's just do it like that. But that presonus has got digital in, it's got MIDI out, it's got like eight inputs. Like it, mm. like it, when you're looking at it as a recording interface and not a USB sound card, way better device. I don't want people to running out and buying one of those and trying to turn it into a sound card to, you know, use with Discord and Zoom calls and stuff. It's not going to be a great experience. But for those of you looking to record some music, people, record your voice, track a drum kit, all the fun stuff you get to do. You got a MIDI keyboard. It's got hardware MIDI built into it. Most of them do. <laughs> the Fado drivers, not going to work for you on Backfire. And those are the ones you want to be using if you're using a FireWire audio interface as a recording interface, not a sound card. So keep that in mind. And I'm going to say, yeah, because who knows? You know, one might be able to go over to the FireWire store and pick one up. Yeah. And get some work <laughs> done. Uh, the PipeWire project hit me back. And you're like, we're going to take a look at it. So. You know, just trying to look out for my brothers and sisters out there, trying to get some recording done on the budget and uh, good times. Go check that out if you want. You get a chance. And uh, all the other stuff I got posted over there, working on, um, I'm going to try to convince you kids. I kind of talked about it just a little bit in the pre-show. Try to convince you that uh, a very expensive, overpriced USB capture card is not overpriced. It's still yeah. overpriced, but there's a reason for it. <laughs> Stay <Yeah>. tuned. for. <laughs> that what do we got up next oh man who remembers the ipod yes i, I was my iPod. wrong i was so <laughs> wrong about the ipod oh. i was i i had to admit it back in the day if you're going to be right about stuff you need to be able to be wrong about stuff <laughs> nobody trusts anybody who's always right all the time uh when that came out i said that was silly apple announced it you know kind yeah. of like we all saw the, uh, what is it? The, what is the new Apple uh, VR toaster thing called? The thing you uh, put on your head? Studio Pro. Um, the, what do you call it? Vision. Is it vision the Vision? Pro. Okay, maybe it's called the, the vision, vision Pro. <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> I always forget the name of that thing, even though I've been talking about it a lot. <laughs> I saw it right there, Vision Pro. All right. Yeah, I saw that. I'm like, that's dumb. I said the same thing when I, I, I read my first little announcement about the iPod. I'm like, that's stupid. Don't nobody want that. Don't nobody need that. We already had Nomad hard drive players. We had Rios from Diamond. We're like, we're good, man. We got all these MP3 <laughs> yeah. players. And like Apple's making <laughs> that thing so expensive compared to all the other ones too. And uh, it was a FireWire device. Who's got FireWire? A true story, kids. And uh, I was wrong, man. I'm like, hey, nobody gonna buy that. Everybody bought one. Mm -hmm. Everybody bought one. I, I still didn't buy yeah. one. I was that edge lord. I'm like, whatever. I'm gonna. I. I did I ever buy one of the hard drives? I might have. I don't know. It was too long ago. Oh, anyway, yeah. if you want to revisit that, <laughs> maybe you didn't buy an iPod at the time, or maybe you wanted something iPod-like, or maybe you could do now. I want to tell you about this. Tangara. Yeah. It's on crowd supply. So what is it? You're thinking about it, man. It's open source iPod-inspired portable music player. Now, why would you want that in 2024? Those of you who might want to listen to music on the go, without the distraction of a mobile device sending you push notifications. Hmm. Hmm. Did I mention it's completely open hardware and open software? 300 people have already backed this, so the campaign is good. They've pledged $135,000. You can reserve one right now for $249 if you want to get one pre-made, which I think is pretty neat. Now, uh, out of the box, you're going to get 3.5 millimeter, you know, your standard headphone jack, uh, Bluetooth, which should be upgradable in the future. Via software defined radio, Wi Fi 4, USB C for charging. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's Pretty really cool. cool. I mean, uh, I actually had a first gen uh, iPod back in the day, then, and later on, I ended up putting Linux on it. <laughs> but this is really sweet. If you, you know, it has, has the classic dial, which, which makes navigating uh, through music titles very easily, and it supports. MP3, FLAC, AUG, Opus, and more audio 
codec support is on the and way. it's got that old Apple wheel on it, too. It does, yeah. And the Tangera actually features a Cirrus Logic WM8523 digital audio converter and a TI-INA1620 amplifier for high-quality audio. And you can print your own case in whatever color you want. I want to give them a little bit of credit. I'm looking at the, pink, <laughs> I'm looking at the, the green and pink ones. Like, they don't have any shame. They're straight... 3d printed these and like they even yeah. include in the video the knackered ones like the ones that had some bad prints on them they're like yeah, yeah, yeah no, things <laughs> happen did. man <laughs> the little pink one's kind of messed up the green one's uh, a little knackered on its left side yeah and it's got lewis scripting c plus plus uh full yeah. size sd card up to two terabytes and uh yeah you can't go wrong with that i, I don't mind stuff like that um uh, build it yourself really carry sweet. it around right <laughs> put the it map really logo on the back of it and it's competitive too. I was looking at the prices of of the high end music players on Amazon, and and you know they range at about a, around a hundred to two hundred dollars. But you don't yeah. get to make your own custom case and build it yourself. <laughs> well, I mean, if you spend two forty nine for this, you don't do any of that either. They just ship you one. Yeah, you can do that too. <laughs> so if you want to spend two forty nine, if you want to get the parts, uh, yeah. I'll have to go dig around for the parts list. But you're probably looking at like. Mm-hmm. If you already got a 3D printer, you're probably looking at like $70, $80 in parts. Yeah. That's not going to be too bad if you want to get old MacGyver. D-I-Y. Good times. Mm-hmm. I wanted to give that awesome. a mention. Uh, high quality audio. So if you want to carry that around. And I like that they mentioned like you can 3D print or you can see and see. Yeah, which is really nice, which means you can like print an aluminum case. Uh-huh. Like our Theron was suggesting in chat. <laughs> get to smelting some- kids. Yeah. All right. We're running a little bit long, but I want to thank everybody for showing up. If you like what we do and you're like, hey, man, these clowns are kind of cool. They're kind of fun. You get a kick, share the show. You know, if it's a repost, yeah. retweet, tell some people about it. I'm like, you, you want to make it a bigger commitment. We have a Patreon. If you want to support us, we give you a bunch of stuff back. The live and uncut versions of these shows delivered to you the same day. We got a commercial free version of this show. If YouTube's getting crazy and you don't want to deal with ad blockers, I'll give you even higher quality video than you're going to get on YouTube. That's exclusive for our Patreon subscribers. Access to our Discord. Me and Jill are doing Trackmania on Tuesdays and Fridays. We've got a gang so of people fun. that show up. 14 <laughs> new maps. If you like little racing games or if you just like a bunch of Linux nerds to hang out with, we got you <laughs> covered. We'd love to have you doing that. A um, couple other things in there. Just go check it out. Patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. We would appreciate it. Mm-hmm. All right. That's going to wrap us up. And speaking of all the people who make the show possible, Let's yeah. go ahead. So Cue many people music. to thank. <laughs> and roll them credits. <laughs> of course, our advisor, our Theron, who's in chat now, and Omegas. We got our executive producers, Barbrandt, Scott M, Atomic, Mike G, our Chicago Kicks People <laughs> level, Super Dust Out, Empty, Blasphemia. <laughs> our sea, number, sea Monsters, Ronald, L, Ver- Veritanuda, David. And yeah, I can't read them fast enough. <laughs> and I don't have good enough vision when the, <laughs> the names get small because there's so many awesome people to thank. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I right, can't do people. what and Jordan do every, <laughs> every Saturday. <laughs> we'll see you next week. <laughs> bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>